Happy anniversary, Fellowship Church. How many are glad to be in the house today? Why don't you do this, slap somebody high five and help, tell them happy birthday. Grab your seats. I'm so excited that you're here today. So excited you came to celebrate with us on a very special occasion. And I want to say thank God for his goodness and his grace for 17 years. And I want to welcome everybody watching online and everybody watching at our Lafayette campus. Come on, can we clap our hands and show your love to everybody there? Man, I'm so thrilled. You know, I was driving in this morning and even getting a little emotional listening to an old school song. You may not have heard it. It was called He's Preparing Me by Daryl Coley. I listened to that song in Bible college, and I remember just I was kneeling at my bedside, little bunk bed in my dormitory, and just wondering, wondering if God could use me. Just saying, God, if you could use anybody, please use me. And, and then 17 years later to look around. Not just my wife and I, but all of you working together. Come on, clap your hands one more time and thank God for allowing us to participate in such a great church like this. God's given us two words for this church. If you know them, shout them out for our anniversary weekend louder than you ever have before. Come on, everybody. Hope. Hope and healing. Hope for you tomorrow and healing from your yesterday. It's all found in him. So super grateful that you're here and uh, I want to jump in today as I preach a message I feel like the Lord gave me directly for this weekend. And grab your notes out, grab a pen, something to write with. I want to preach a message entitled, Lessons from Jars. Say that with me, Lessons from Jars. One more time, come on. I remember our wedding day, and most wedding days have a few things that go wrong. There are a lot of funny things that happen on wedding days. There are people that faint on weddings. And if you actually Google like wedding fails, you'll see a compilation of people just, they're standing there and all of a sudden they just fall out. It's the best thing in the world. And not funny then, funny now. But I think the worst part uh, had to have been this bride all dressed up and she vomited during the vows. Can you imagine? She's been waiting her entire life for this day, and she vomits in the vow. It's so sad. And can you imagine what took place after that? Like, you may now kiss your bride. No, thank you. Mm -mm. <clears throat> How about we shake on it? You know what I mean? Like, that's silly with the shake. So nice to marry you. My wedding day had some things go wrong. One in particular, and they blame me for it. Um, I guess I was responsible to get Diana a ride to the church, and I forgot. Okay, so my bad. I forgot. And, and so I forgot to get a ride for my bride on the biggest day of her life. People were like, where's Diana? I'm like, I don't know. Am I my sister's keeper? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> a lot of funny things take place. Cakes fall over. You know, people trip. That matter of fact, this is a true story. There was a, there was a little boy. He was coming down with the rings. And he was growling at everybody in the, in, in the aisle. He'd walk up to people and go, rawr, go in the rawr. Afterwards, they were like, what in the world is wrong with you? And he was like, well, I'm the ring bear. <laughs> True story. We got some funny pictures here, funny pictures. And this is how you know you have some good friends. Take a look when they're willing to dry your pits before the wedding. Come on, how many have some friends like that? <laughs> Just to make sure you're good. Here's another one. This is when you know um, the rest of the basketball team couldn't make it. That's a tall girl. How about this one? This is when everybody's like, hey, let's all get on the dock and take a picture. And you got one too many groomsmen. Yeah, not funny that day. It's funny now. Here's one. This is um, when you say, Let one, two, three, jump. And then your legs kick behind your dress. It looks like he married a ghost. That's strange. This is, next one is when you ask the, the, the baker, hey, I'd really like to get, make a cake that captures my wife, and he goes overboard. <laughs> Guys, how weird is that? That looks just like her. <laughs> All right, here's one. This is our campus director at Lafayette. His name is Ryan Gilbreth, and there's so much in this that blesses me. First of all, his hair. <laughs> Secondly, this has actually made it onto the Ellen Show. She deemed this the ugliest face at a wedding. Yes, yeah, she did. And so 
I don't think it does it justice, but I, I, maybe we should zoom in, huh? This is how you know. This is how you know you love your wife when you have cellulite chin. Come on, somebody. That's, that's bad. All right, so listen, I think there's been a few of us that have had some things go wrong at a wedding. And um, it's, again, it's funny now. Years later, it's not funny on that day. Well, I want to show you a wedding in the Bible that Jesus attended. He attended a wedding. As a matter of fact, it's where he did his first miracle. No miracles for 30 years. And he knew that he was living a sinless life so that his sinless life can be accredited to our life. And that our sinful life would be then put on him. So age 30, he performs his first miracle at a wedding by turning water into wine. And I want to set the stage for you. Picture this. You're there in the dusty streets of Cana. Everybody in the town is gathered because everybody is invited. And then you have this couple that has designated this moment to dedicate their make a vow to God and to each other. Jesus and his boys roll in, his disciples. And this wedding reception would not be celebrated for a couple of hours. In this culture, you didn't celebrate for hours. You celebrated for days. So it was not like, hey, till six in the morning. No, it was like till six next Friday. And the family had to keep bringing food and keep bringing wine for everybody. We pick up the story in John chapter two. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. I love the fact that Jesus, by the way, is on a mission to change the world and yet has no problem pausing to be with people. He visits a wedding because the mission is people and people are at the wedding, but they're very quickly going to identify him as no ordinary wedding guest and he is about to change their lives. Take a look at this next part. When the wine was gone, somebody say, "Uh uh-oh. Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. I love the way Jesus responded. He's like, woman? Which I don't recommend you talk to your mama that way. I tried, and it did not go well with me. Actually, this is not a sign of disrespect in this culture. It would have been more like ma'am, or it was a term of endearment. So, ma'am, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. Okay, look at me. Jesus knew that the moment he did a miracle, it would fast forward and speed up the process to the cross. He knew that once there's a miracle, there is no closing that door. Jesus is there. She says, we have no more wine. You have to understand culturally, to have run out of wine at the wedding ceremony would be a huge embarrassment to the couple. But how many are grateful that even before they had a problem, Jesus already had a solution? Oh, you need to know that before you even have a problem, Jesus is the solution. And everybody saw the problem at the wedding, but nobody came to Jesus except Mary. Because Mary was so close to Jesus, she knew as soon as she identified the problem, she turned around and took that straight to him because she knew he's the only one who could help in a time of need. Listen, if you're not careful, we will tend to forget that we need everything that Jesus is, and he is the answer to every equation. Oh, I don't think you're hearing me today. If you need peace, guess what? He's the answer. If you need joy, guess what? He's the answer. Come on, help me preach on our anniversary weekend. If you need love, he's the answer. If you need forgiveness, he's the answer. If you need eternal life, he's the answer. If you need freedom from fear, he's the answer. If you need help in your marriage, he's the answer. He is everything that we need, and we need everything that he is. Come on, clap your hands and thank God today. He's a provider. Before we even know what we need, he steps in with a solution. Mary turns in the very next verse and says to everybody in the room, do whatever he tells you. She didn't know how he would answer. She just knew he could answer. See, Mary had faith even though she didn't have clarity. You don't have to fully understand God before you fully obey God. She didn't know how he was going to do it. She just knew that he could do it. And in this moment, I want to step out in faith like Mary, because Mary stepped out in faith. And even though she did not have clarity, she knew that she had to step out in faith and trust the provider. Anybody glad that Jesus still still 2,000 years later is a providing God? Come on, clap your hands one more time. 
when our resources run out, when our strength runs out, when our hope runs out, he is what we need. Do whatever he tells you to, she says. Even though she didn't have clarity, she still had faith. It's kind of like when you scroll through Instagram and every once in a while you come across a picture that's not clear yet. It's still a little blurry. But you know, if you wait there just a few seconds, that which is blurry will become clear when the connection gets better. <laughs> There's some things in our life that God's called us to. Listen to me, everybody. It's blurry at first, but when you obey God and wait on God's timing, that which is blurry will become clear as the connection grows stronger with the Lord. Do whatever he tells you to. When we started this church, the vision was cloudy. All I knew was to start a church, and I didn't know how. It didn't look very good. We had 22 people in a living room, had our first weekend service, and we had 105 show up. I thought revival had broken out. It didn't look like much. We had some plastic chairs in the middle and some metal chairs on the side. Our church had options. I bought these plastic chairs at a hardware store. They had a plastic chair, a picnic, you know, those white chairs you can stack up to 100,000. They had chairs for $3 and chairs for a dollar. Which one do you think I bought? The $1 chair, baby, which is all good until this hefty built man comes in, decides he's going to sit in that chair. And again, no problem, sir. The problem occurred when this brother decided he was going to lean back in my sermon while I'm pre I'm like, mid-preach, Jesus loves you. He has a plan for your life. And those back two little legs just gave up the ghost. They were like, bink, and he falls right down on the bootay while I'm preaching. They don't teach you how to deal with that in Bible college. I didn't want to draw attention to him, but I didn't want to embarrass him either. I'm like, hey, you good, brother? Like, you... You all right? <laughs> like, you hit the ground pretty hard. You bounced to, I, I'm like, he never came back. I know what you're thinking. Sean, you should have gone with a $3 chair. <laughs> we didn't look like much. Preach, little white boy preacher with a suit way too big off the rack, looking like the sugar side of a mini wheat commercial. I like the frosting inside. Like, everything was too big. It didn't look clear at first. Didn't know what we were doing at first, but God just gave us a vision and we stepped out. I'm here to tell you, we didn't have to have full clarity to fully obey God for the step out and start the church. And what happened is we were having kids' classrooms in the hallway and pretty soon we're moving from school to school because the city said you had to move every single year. We're playing musical churches and then all of a sudden we're running out of options and God says, why don't you take a look at this hardware store in Antioch? We come into this hardware store, God fills it up, and then we turn around and launch a second campus. Listen to me, everybody. It all starts starts with the word. Do whatever he says to do. It's crazy that it starts with obeying the word of the Lord. A lot of people are like, God, give me a new word. Give me a new word. And I'm thinking, why would God give that person a new word when they haven't been faithful to obey the last one? Give me a word, God. Yeah, he wants to give you a word. But when he gives you a word, let's be first responders. Oh, I love the firemen. I love the, a I love the EMTs. They're first responders. Well, when it comes to obeying God's word, how about we become the first? How about we become the first to give, the first to pray, the first to tell our neighbors about God, the first to bring somebody to church, the first to go to growth track, the first to start a small group, the first to join the dream team. Somebody say, me first. It's the only place where me first is appropriate when we step out in faith first. Now, what Jesus did next would require some faith. <laughs> Just like everything with him, by the way, because he likes for us to participate. I love that. Like God could just do all these miracles by himself, but he loves to have you participate. It's funny how it requires God's word even to build our faith. Some people, they come for prayer like, hey, Pastor Sean, pray for my faith. Pray for my faith. I'm like, well, I could pray for your faith, but that's not how faith comes. Romans 10 verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want your faith to rise, get in the Bible and begin to read the word of God and you will find that your faith start to bubble up. Look at verse six, Jesus at the wedding, there's no more wine. And nearby stood six stone water jars, 
How many jars? How many jars? The kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill these jars, say jars, with water. And so they filled them to the brim. Let's unpack this for a moment. These jars were used for ceremonial washing. In the Old Testament, which is the first part of your Bible before Jesus Christ came on the scene, there was a bunch of rules and regulations that God would establish to let people know, if you want to be made right with God, here's how to do it. You have to obey all these rules. Problem, no man or woman in the entire history of the world could ever obtain all those rules. You and I have never perfectly kept the Ten Commandments. So this was actually ineffective for helping us become right with God. Are you tracking so far? Say yes. These jars would be used for ceremonial washing. So when somebody would come into the presence of God, they would dip their hands in the jar and they'd wash their hands, hoping to, that would be a symbol of a purification process. Problem, they had clean hands, but it did not clean the heart. So they're going through the motions, but not really having relationship with Jesus, not, not really knowing the God of Israel. And so God comes on the scene through Jesus, and he's like, I don't want a dead religious system. I want genuine relationship with my people. So there's how many jars? How many jars? What's the number of completion? Jesus would become the perfect finish to the old way of knowing God. Six purification jars, six jars that they would focus on and lean into to hopefully make them right with God. Jesus steps on the scene as the seventh item, and he says, no, 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 no. I'm going to do away with this way of knowing me, and I'm going to, first of all, let you know I'm a provider. And secondly, he would turn this water into a crimson red wine, pointing to the fact that he was now taking away the old dead religious system and replacing it with his blood to make sure that we have access to Almighty God. This was the first miracle, turning water into wine. And watch this, watch this. His disciples were there and saw everything. Three years later, at the Last Supper, the very last night where Jesus was betrayed, Jesus gives his disciples the bread and breaks it and says, this is my body that will be broken for you as a symbol pointing to his life that would die on a cross. And then he takes a glass of wine and he says, this represents my blood in a new covenant of grace. I wonder, do you think that the disciples in that moment had a flashback to the very first miracle where Jesus is now bookending his public ministry where he started with a glass of wine and he ended with a glass of wine all pointing to the blood of Jesus that would do away with an old dead religious system and says, now my blood will wash you clean. Come on, do you think they connected the dots of Hebrews 9.22 that said, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And Jesus says, my blood will be the one that cleanses you totally and completely from every solitary sin. Knowing this, that running out of wine was not their only problem at the wedding. See, these Jewish believers for centuries had focused on a Jewish purification process of cleansing the hands, but it couldn't cleanse the soul. And that is until Jesus, the sinless Son of God, stepped on the scene and poured out his blood on a cross for us. And now the Bible says if we now confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to purify us once and for all, for all of our unrighteousness. Oh, come on. Is there anybody grateful? We don't have to follow a list of rules, but we can come through Jesus Christ and be made whole. All of this took place as a symbol at a wedding. And remember, every miracle is pointing to something bigger. It's a spiritual truth. It's pointing to Jesus. And notice to what extent they filled these jars. What did it say? To the brim. What if they only would have had faith to fill them halfway? What if they only would have had faith to fill them three quarters of the way? It's interesting because they filled it to the brim. I think it wasn't a half-hearted obedience. It was, I'm filling it to the brim. To the brim means I'm all in. Watch this. Um, 
it, it takes six to, to 12 months to make wine. I don't drink, but I studied it for this sermon. <laughs> it takes six to 12 months to just make wine. See, what would take you and I a long time, Jesus can do in a moment. Oh, I wish I would. I wish there was a couple people that could go back and remember what Jesus was doing in a moment, which you were striving to do for a long time. Is there anybody here that was struggling with fear and worry and anxiety, and you tried to get free from that for years, and then all of a sudden, one moment in the presence of Almighty God transformed everything? Come on, is there anybody that's been striving for getting a job, and you tried on your own strength, and you came up for prayer, and God opened up a door in the middle of no... Come on, is there anybody today that knows? What would take us a long time to do, God can do in a moment. But the only ones who obeyed were the ones who got to see. Only those who obeyed the word of the Lord got to see. You say, wait a second, Sean. Everybody was able to benefit from the miracle. Yeah, they were able to benefit, but they didn't participate. I don't want to just see revival. I want to participate. I don't want to just see God do great things in the Bay Area. I would like to participate. And, and only ones who obey got to see it. Like how many miracles do people miss because they refuse to participate? How many miracles do people miss because they refuse to obey the word of the Lord? What would have happened if we would have quit 10 years ago when we wanted to quit? Many of you don't know this, but I was underneath my desk crying, literally crying my eyes out, saying, God, pass this church to somebody else, another pastor who could take it to where it needs to go, because I've hit my lid. And I don't think that I, I don't, I didn't believe that God could use us to reach thousands anymore. That dream stopped and it died. How many are grateful that with God, nothing's dead, it's just asleep? I don't know how many marriages have been restored in this church. I don't know how many people have given their life to Jesus in this church. I don't know how much hope and how much healing has happened in this church. And not just because of Sean and Diana, but because of all of us working together. Come on. Has God ever used you to participate in the restoration of somebody else? Aren't you glad you showed up on that day? You were too tired, but you had a conversation that changed somebody's life completely. Aren't you glad you led that small group when you're like, I'm, I think I'm a little too busy. And then God worked a miracle in somebody's life. Aren't you glad that you participated? when you everything inside of you didn't want to turn and tell somebody he's preaching verse 8 then he told them draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet they did so and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine he did not realize where to come from but watch this the servants who participated they knew and then he called for the bridegroom and said to them, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine, the boxed wine, after the guests have had too much to drink. Watch this, watch this, watch this. We're going somewhere. But you save the best till now. <laughs> Say that with me. But you save the best Till now, if you feel like life has been mediocre for you, don't worry. I've got some good news for you. I believe God has saved the best till now. Oh, these 17 years have been amazing. The growth has been outstanding, but I believe that God has saved the best Till now, I believe this is the best time for dreams to come alive. I believe this is the best stories that will come around from this church. I believe it's the best time to reach people who are far from God. I believe this is the best time to help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. Come on, clap your hands if you're grateful today that God will allow us to participate in the best season of the church. And just like the wine was the best that Jesus made, life in him is also the best. Why wait, though, till you run out to turn to him? The truth is, some of you have already run out, and you came today empty. It's okay, because just like the wedding, Jesus is here to save the day. Oh, come on, clap your hands and thank God Almighty. He's still here to save the day.
Here's what he wants to do. He wants to change what's in the jars. They were empty, and then he filled them, and then they're transformed. They were empty, they were filled, and transformed. It's the same thing he wants to do to you. We came in empty, he then fills us with his love, and then transforms us. Oh, is there anybody here that's been transformed? Where, where, where you look back at who, who you used to be and say, man, I'm so grateful. I'm not where I ought to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I don't think the same. I don't talk the same. I'm not struggling with the same fear and depression. Oh, no, I've been transformed by the love of God. <laughs> Let me show you another story about jars. Jesus changed the water into wine and these jars. And then in 2 Kings, there's a widow. Her husband dies, and the creditors are coming to take the Honda. <laughs> Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And the servant said, there is nothing there at all. Isn't it funny how that's always our answer? We don't have anything at all. And then she thought about it and began to realize can't lie to the man of God. She says, uh, except the small jar. Somebody say jar. I just have a small jar of oil. Oh, so you do have something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's insignificant. Isn't it funny how we always focus on what we don't have instead of what we do have? I have nothing at all. All through the Bible, God has worked with people. Who thought they just had a little bit? I just have a little bit of oil. Jesus tells his disciples, go feed the 5,000. Like, we just have a little lunch. David has a giant in front of him, and he just has a little slingshot, just a little oil. How about we stop focusing on what we don't have and use what we do have and realize that with God, he can use the little as long as he's involved. Verse 3. Elisha said, go around now and ask all your neighbors for empty. Every time you see the word jars, can you help me preach and say jars? For ask your neighbors for empty jars. jars. Don't ask for just a few. Don't ask for a few. Go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Watch this. Pour oil into the jars. all of them and each. And when they're filled up, put them to the side. She left him, shut the door behind her and her sons, and they brought the jars to her, and she kept on pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. That's when the oil stopped flowing. She went on and told the man of God, and he said, go and sell all the oil, pay off that Honda, and live you and your sons on what's left. Okay, watch this. She said, I have nothing at all except a little bit of oil. God took what was in her hand, just a little bit, and she came over to her neighbors, and she filled up their jars with oil. The oil kept on flowing. She would have died with her family if she would have been nervous to share. She thought at first, I just have a little bit of oil for me and my sons to make like one more meal, and then it's all over. But she now put her faith in God to her friends and neighbors brought jars. And every time they would pass her another jar, it would be filled up. Her friends would bring another jar. God would fill it up. Her friends would bring another jar. They'd fill it up. Every single jar until the last jar was filled. That's when the oil finally stopped. Somebody say, pass me another jar. I believe the number of jars brought to her was a direct indication of the level of her faith. How many jars were filled? As many as were brought to her. As I'm reading this, I can't, but I can't help it but to think of these jars as more campuses of Fellowship Church. Oh, listen, listen, listen. As many jars as we provide for God, that's how many jars I believe he'll fill up. 
We started way back in an elementary cafetorium smelling like tater tots and gym socks, and God filled up that jar. We said, bring us another jar of a second service. God filled up the second service. Bring me another jar of a third service. God filled up the third service. God, bring me another jar of a fourth service. God filled up the fourth service. God, bring me another jar of a fifth service on a Sunday in a community center. God filled up the jar. We now move into a community center from that into an orchard supply hardware store, this building, with three services, God filled it up. We said, bring me another jar. He filled up four services. He said, bring me another jar. He filled up five services. And now we start on a second campus in life. I'm wondering, is there anybody in this room that would believe with me that God can fill up as many jars as we're willing to provide? Somebody say, pass me another jar. Come on, turn and touch two people. Pass me another jar. Pass me another jar. I don't want the oil to stop with us. I'm praying that God would allow us to ask a, God, pass me another jar. Maybe Brentwood needs a campus. Oh, maybe we say pass me another jar where Concord needs their own campus. What if San Jose needs a campus? What if Oakland and Richmond and Hayward need a campus? Come on, everybody. We don't want this oil to stop with just us. We're asking Almighty God. Give us more jars. Give us more faith. Give us the ability to reach more people with hope and healing. Come on, somebody clap your hands and say a good amen. amen. It's crazy because the Bible says the man of God told her, you can now live on, you and your sons live on the rest. What is that? It's legacy. I don't know if you realize this, but you are building a church that will outlast you. Hmm. You say, isn't the church big enough? Oh, so sorry. You have the wrong perception of the church. Do you think if your family members came, we should probably make room for them? Pass me another jar. Jesus said, well, he's at another wedding. The master, Jesus, he said to the servant, go out onto the roads to the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be, come on, shout it out. Jesus' desire is for the church to grow. If you don't understand that, you don't understand that heaven and hell are realities, that we can't keep the oil to ourselves. We have to continually ask God for more, more influence, more impact. We're praying. And Tommy Barnett was here on a Wednesday night last week. Oh, man, if you miss First Wednesday, you are missing out. He preached on multiplication, and I'm praying that a multiplication anointing would come on our church to where we can have more impact, more influence than we've ever had before, because God moves in spaces and places. All these buildings are are jars. All this was was an old hardware store where people came to get tools to fix their homes. We transformed it into a place where people come to get tools to fix their lives in Jesus' name. We've met in cafeterias. We've met in theaters. We've met in high school gymnasiums. It doesn't matter. We're just turning it into a jar where somebody's life can be changed. Pass me another jar. How many gave your life to Jesus in a jar? Come on. Community center, cafeteria, theater, this building. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Wave at me, wave at me. God moves in spaces and places. Help me find another jar. So Jesus works a miracle in the jars of the wedding. God works a miracle in the jars of the widow. Let me show you the big reveal. Second Corinthians chapter three. You ready for this? You are a letter from Christ written, not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on the tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. If you read on, this verse is describing the Old Testament, how it placed a veil over people's head, their faces, and they could not really have a relationship with God until Jesus Christ came. Therefore, now, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry, we have are all ministers of the gospel. I'm, I, I'm here to train you up as a ministry. Watch this, watch this. So don't lose heart. See, some of you came in today so overwhelmed with life that you're about to give up. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Why? You ready for this? Because there's purpose. Here's the reveal. Watch this, watch this. But we have this treasure in I don't think you got it. God 
has placed the ministry of his mercy in jars of clay. What's jars of clay? Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. God took some clay and made Adam and breathed life into him. God is saying, listen, not only am I going to move in spaces and places, but I'm putting my ministry of mercy inside of you. You are a living, active jar to carry the message of Jesus' grace to people who need hope and healing. Now watch this. Some people like the widow will come and get their lives or their jar filled. That's a great place to start. But I love this widow because the widow did not just believe God had enough for her jar. She turned around and asked her neighbors to come and filled up their jars too. She was not one-sided. She was not thinking if this is just going to benefit me. She thought, I know God has enough not just for my jar, but for everybody else's jar in my sphere. And this is the, this is the point where we begin to realize we can't just come to church the same old, same old way anymore. Like if we're going to reach the Bay Area, watch this, watch this. We can't approach church with the same mentality. We come empty. He then fills us and transforms us. Paul took Timothy on a missionary trip. Paul, the apostle, took Timothy with him on a journey and then left him in a city to start a church. Timothy did not say, but I want to go with you. I want to go where you're preaching live. Paul knew that in order to reach more people, he had to provide some more jars. Timothy knew. He said, I'll be sent on assignment. He trusted his pastor enough to say, Paul, if you think this is where I ought to start planting a church, then I will stay here. See, Timothy knew we don't serve God based on convenience. We serve based on conviction. We serve God based on a mission. And we're asking, help us identify new campuses, new cities, new jars where we can reach more people with hope and healing. And I'm going to be asking you, once we launch these other campuses, to go to the campus that is closest to you. Because we are not just attending church church. We are the church. We are not just filling up our jars for us. We're saying, God, how can I build? How can I grow? How can I serve and build more people? Somebody say, pass me another jar. Jesus is the provider, the expediter, and the multiplier. He's the provider. He provides everything that we have need of. He is an expediter. What would take us long years to do on our own, he can do in a moment. And then he multiplies our effectiveness. And on this 17th anniversary of our church, may we never forget, it is all for his glory. John 2, 11, at the wedding Jesus did here in Canada, in Galilee, it was the first of all the signs, watch this, through which he revealed his it's all for him. It's all for him. And there is a mission and a mandate. Empty, filled, transformed. Somebody say, pass me another jar. I believe God is calling us to a higher level of commitment to him to reach the lost. I know your heart is just like mine. We want to help as many people as possible. Look at me, everybody. It's pretty hard, though, to build with people who aren't here. May the Lord encourage us. There's enough oil for you and your family and your neighbors and the entire Bay Area. I pray that the oil of God's goodness never stops over this church because we keep providing more jars filled with faith for the Great Commission. I'd like us to read the Great Commission out. This is the big challenge from Jesus himself. Matthew 28, 19. Let's read it out loud together. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You want Jesus to be with you? 
You don't have to pray for it. Just make his number one agenda, your number one agenda, to find his lost kids. He says, if you do that, if you do that, I'll be with you. Somebody say, pass me another jar. Come on, everybody, pass me another jar. Father, I pray for every person here. I thank you, first of all, for your grace over their life. Thank you for the value of their life. Thank you for what they mean to you and to this church. I thank you, God, that you're challenging us to step out in faith, to take our next step, to join the growth track, to get on the dream team, to begin to serve, to reach more people. I pray for supernatural favor, that you'd open up the right doors in the right cities, give us the right people to expand. We could just cruise. Church is pretty good. But that's not your heart and that's not ours. So I thank you for a fresh anointing to fall over this church and a jar-filling anointing. I pray that there would never be a building big enough to house what you want to do through us. Provide the finances, the people, and the passion in Jesus' name. If you're here and you say, Sean, I need to give my life to Jesus. Maybe you were once close to God, but you've drifted. Maybe you've never surrendered the controls of your life to him. Today would be a great day to do that. And I'm not going to have you stand or come to the front. My heart is never to embarrass anybody. It's just simply to connect you to him. And today on this anniversary weekend, I wonder... Could you lift your hand up if that's you and say, count me in that prayer when you pray it on the count of three. Come on here, Lafayette, watching online, wherever you're watching this, you can respond to. Come on, one, two, three. This is me. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. Come on, let's really clap our hands. We're so proud of you. So excited. Would you pray this with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me right where I am. Today I give you my life. Forgive me from my sin. Wash me clean and be my Lord and Savior. Take the little that I have my time, talents, and resource and use it to reach others with your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. May that never get old to us. And I pray that that number would just begin to skyrocket as we provide more opportunity. How many feel a fresh commitment to the house of God? Amen, everybody. He wants his church filled, and we're going to fill it. I believe that God's going to open up some great doors of opportunity. Let's just begin to walk through them.